Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Network Infrastructure and Ransomware's Crosshairs, How to Address the Supply Chain Threats. My name is Melissa Russell, and I'll be the host for today's webinar. And before we begin, I just wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. We are going to be recording this session, and I will be making a link to the recording as well as to the slides available uh, probably in an email tomorrow. Uh, you'll also be able to find it on EclipseCM.com under the events and webinars section. Um, if you do have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to go ahead and throw them into the Q&A box, and we will save some time at the end to address some questions. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speakers. I am thrilled to be joined by my colleagues, Nate Warfield, who is our Director of Threat Research, and also joined by Tyson Supasat, who is our Director of Product Marketing. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and hand it over to Tyson. Gentlemen, have the floor is yours. <laughs> Thanks, Melissa. Um, yeah, in the, the webinar today, we're going to be talking a little bit about, you know, how ransomware attacks against network devices are starting to ramp up. We'll take a little bit of a historical perspective. We'll look at it from the attacker's perspective, like why are they targeting these devices? And then the challenges uh, that defenders have in, in securing these devices. And then Nate's going to run through an attack demo to show you what it looks like when when uh you know an attacker targets a network device and what do they do next with that access and then we'll talk a little bit about the solution you know what what's needed or what are the different things that are needed um with that yeah i'll just get started uh going to go over a little bit of history going back to 2020 these are all ransomware uh uh incidents involving network devices. And we can see that, you know, Ragnarok uh, ransomware was pretty early on uh, targeting Citrix AD, ADCs. Um, later on, we, we saw a, a, a wide scale campaign targeting Pulse Secure v, VPN uh, devices in that solution. In, so these are, uh, they're using these devices as an initial access point, and then also to um, facilitate lateral movement within the organization. And then of course, uh, in the spring of 2020, we, you know, everybody was put under COVID restrictions, and um, it just put a, a big highlight on VPN infrastructure. Um, I, a lot of you may remember, you know, the uh, in, ensuring remote access was was super important. And then later that year, we we saw attacks against uh, Sophos firewalls and those Pulse Secure VPN devices as well. Um, Nate, was there anything here in the 2020 um, timeline that that you wanted to bring up? Um, yeah, there was also uh, in the summer of 2020, there was also a uh, there was a vulnerability that came out for F5 uh, big IP devices uh, right before the 4th of July. And that uh, that went under or it underwent some pretty widespread uh, exploitation like the Sunday and Monday after the 4th of July. Um, I don't know how many it was hundreds, if not thousands of machines that had been compromised, but it was mostly in, in the IR that we did. Um, was a lot of just stuff like coin miners and um, attempting to put Mirai on these like big big iron devices. So there was that was that was definitely another 2020 thing. Yeah, I, I've left out like uh, so many other uh, security incidents involving network devices um, that weren't directly attributed to ransomware. So in these cases, usually it's uh, security researchers of uh, you know groups like Mandiant. Who are going in as part of their uh, incident response and doing forensics and attribution, and that's how we get these these types of headlines. But you know, to your point, yeah, there are, there are tons of other, <laughs> you know, uh, botnets, nation state attackers that are going after these appliances as well. Um, in 2021, we saw uh, Cream ransomware targeting Fortinet, Fortinet, uh, Fortigate. Uh, VPN devices. Uh, there were uh, Lockbit 3.0 uh, appeared at that time, and they were, um, you know, some of the tactics that they were uh, using were we were compromising uh, F5 networks appliances. Later on, we we saw uh, Mandian a ransomware group they call UNC 2447, where they were uh, targeting SonicWall. 
And then um, there was a stole credential stolen from 87,000 Fortinet devices that were published on a ransomware forum later in uh, 2021. Jumping forward to 2023, uh, this, this summer has been really crazy. Um, it started off with uh, CISA um, issuing a binding operational directive to all federal agencies. They, they told them, hey, we're going to be scanning you guys, just like the attackers would, if we find management inter interfaces that um, are don't have zero trust controls, uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna talk to you. And in any ways, that was uh, I think that that binding operational directive was um, part of you know in response to an uh, an uptick in activity that they were observing. Um, later in July, we there was a really nasty uh, zero day with the Citrix NetScalers. Um, the the nature of that vulnerability was such that you know we uh, we could all track pretty much um, the the exploits happening. You could see which which devices had been compromised just from an internet scan. And so we we saw it reached uh, 30,000, more than 30,000 uh, devices. And um, I believe two days after Citrix issued a patch, uh, the ransomware group that some had attributed to uh, Fin8, they, they launched a, a mass uh, exploitation campaign, just underscoring, you know, how quickly the attackers can take advantage of these uh, these newly published vulnerabilities much faster than most organizations are able to respond. And then um, later in the summer, we saw Akira and Lockbit targeting Cisco VPNs. Um, there was a, a, some really nasty zero days announced in Cisco IOS. And of course, uh, what's still ongoing is the Citrix bleed um, vulnerability that Lockbit and the Black Cat group have used to tremendous success. They've been able to, um, you know, install ransomware in organizations like Boeing, the um, I believe it's uh, International Chinese Bank something. <laughs> it's like a, it's a it's a one a part of the of the global uh, securities trading um, uh, infrastructure. Um, the shipping giant DP World and even Fidelity National Financial ho holding up lots of people from getting their home mortgages. Um, anything to to add here, Nate? Um, not specific. I mean, you pretty much you did cover a lot of these, but yeah, this is 2023. Um, we kind of skimmed over 2022, which is fine. Um, but there was a really interesting Mandiant blog last year about a, uh, a group that they called initially uh, UNC uh, 3524 that I believe they're now attributing to Cozy Bear out of Russia. Uh, and they had a pretty long write-up about how this actor was using basically access into network devices, load balancers, storage uh, controllers, and using that access and, and that position on the network, they were able to get dwell times of like 18 months before they were being detected. So that was that was another thing that we kind of saw last last year and then this year, there's also been the Barracuda, um, the Barracuda O-Days that were being exploited or O-Day that was being exploited earlier in the year. Uh, and it was that was an interesting one in that um, for the first time, and I, I chatted with some of the folks from Mandy and who did that IR, it was one of the first times they've actually seen attackers uh, in the wild doing things of using the device configuration system to sort of back up and store their command and control malware. So while Barracuda was having people uh, essentially wipe and send their byte devices back and they'd RMA them a new one. Um, if you'd snapshot of the config post uh, compromise, the actors were going in within a day or two of the first blog coming out about it. And they were going in and changing the way that their malware was installed on these devices. So that ideally, or the, the idea being, if you back it up, get a new device, install it, put the config back down, um, the malware or their, their C2 implants would come back um, so that was a that was another interesting sort of evolution of these attack campaigns. Yeah. So I mean, the 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 reason we've we've gone through uh, th this history is is just to show that um, ransomware groups are really targeting uh, these devices. Why? Why, Nate? 
<laughs> oh boy. Um, so there's a lot of reasons. Um, so the thing about these devices is that uh, by and large, most of the, many of these things have to be exposed to the internet just to do their, just to do their job. Um, we did see, so if we, if we roll the clock back to uh, 2019, where the, I think it was 2018, 19, where one of the first Pulse VPN uh, exploits came out, that was actually exploiting the VPN sort of endpoint. So there's really no way to take that off the internet. We say a lot of times, oh, keep your management interfaces off the internet, but when it's attacking an actual service endpoint, there's nothing you can do to stop that. Um, we did see with, uh, and then the Citrix one from 2019, that, uh, that was also against their VPN endpoint. So there was really nothing you could do short of patching. The F5 one from 2020 was against their management interfaces, which, you know, we see, you know, CISA is saying, take your management in interfaces off the internet. Uh, they wouldn't have to say that if people weren't doing it uh, extensively. So that was, that was what got a lot of people in trouble there. And then, um, yeah, even to the, even this this year, the Citrix bleed and the other Citrix volume, I don't remember, it didn't get a Fauci name. Those were also against the, the stuff that basically the service endpoints that you have to expose to the internet. And the problem too with these devices is that when we start to dig into these vulnerabilities, um, they're fairly trivial. Uh, I think the, the Citrix one from 2019, the F5 one from 2020 and the F5 one from 2022 um, could all fit in a tweet. I have this kind of thing about exploits that fit in tweets. So they're yeah. pretty egregiously simple exploits. Uh, and in these devices, when you get into them, they don't have any of the stuff, the, the memory protection things that we've kind of gotten used to having in, in operating systems like Windows of ASLR and Stack Canaries and all these other protections to keep uh, memory corruption and buffer overflows or buffer underreads from actually being exploitable. These things don't have it. So we're kind of dealing with... Uh, <laughs> problems that we've solved in the operating systems that we're sitting in front of, but they're still sticking around in the actual infrastructure that runs the internet. So there's that. Um, and then the other problem is that because uh, because EDR is getting so good and, you know, we see, I, I spent a lot of time in groups of, you know, everybody's throwing, sharing threat intelligence, they're sharing signatures, they're sharing hunting queries. Um, that's great. And it's risen, it's raised the bar for attackers to be able to get a foothold in your network, right? It's not mm -hmm. as easy as just, Sending a sending an executable and having somebody run it right. There's a lot of a lot of work and a lot of money has been dumped into making, you know, attacks to a user desktop a much harder, uh, much more complicated process, right? Either either getting exploits, it's hard to it's hard to exploit Windows a lot harder than it used to be. Um, and if you don't have an exploit, then yeah, you can try to fish them. But a lot of the things that your the, the traditional phishing campaigns would do are now detectable. So attackers. Mm -hmm are their business it's financially driven where's the sort of return on investment if they don't have to put a lot of investment into attacking a piece of networking hardware that's great because once they get into it it's got a lot of privileged access mm -hmm. um, it's not really something that edr can cover there's really you know people talk about like ndr network defense or network detection response that's more looking at like packet cap looking at traffic on the like across the internet or whatever traffic is coming into your environment trying to find weird things um, but it's not necessarily going to pick up somebody exploiting the endpoint of your VPN controller. And if you've got, say, like a Netscaler and you've got 10,000 users connecting to you, this VPN endpoint, how can you mm -hmm. really tell where the malicious traffic is, right? Are you actually able to look at every single payload? It also becomes complicated in the fact that everything's wrapped in TLS, so it's all encrypted. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of ways that makes it really hard to detect exploitation. And then because of their position in the network, because they're so uh, so well connected, and a lot of these things, um, F5, Citrix, Cisco, Juniper, I know for a fact, all run either Linux or BSD, different flavors. Mm -hmm. So when you get into it, there's all sorts of useful tools um, that you can use on these things. There's either like some of them, like a lot of the, the devices that do VPN stuff usually have some sort of an LDAP client so they can talk to Active Directory to authenticate people to the back end. So you've now got an, uh, an Active Directory tool, um, they've usually got Python 2 on them, so you may be able to bring over some tools, or I had a certain amount of luck having ChatGPT write me some tools in Python 2, like port scanners and uh, SMB brute force, or just to see if I could basically do like a living off the land thing on a piece of networking equipment. Um, and yeah, like I said, there they that's that is uh, I've been saying this for a while, but this would be my this is my favorite place to live as an attacker, and unfortunately, it seems like um, a little bit of a prophecy here where everybody's starting to do it. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah, and and you know, yesterday we had been talking about you had been explaining about the different network plugs, and I, even I think the image that we have here, Ooh. you see off to the right, yeah. there's management ports, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good point, Tyson. Um, so one of the things I, I kind of touched on the whole management interface is being exposed to the internet. Um, now, as people were starting to get the sort of wrap their brains around taking these things off the internet. Uh, and even yesterday, I went looking uh, when we were chatting, Tyson, I looked for F5 management interfaces on the Internet. And I can tell you back in 2020, I think there was 13 or 14,000 of them that we found online. Um, today, most of the ones that you'd find on Shodan are actually honeypots. Like it kind of emulates a big IP, but it's not. And so I kind of did some Shodan hackery and I was only able to find maybe 700 uh, management interfaces for an F5 that were actually exposed. Um, one of the tricky things, and we saw this at um, the company, I, the big, large Redmond company I worked at in 2020, uh, they had a bunch of their F5s get hacked. And the problem was not that they were doing something dumb, right? If you notice like that picture you're talking about, Tyson, there's two little ports off to the right. Those are generally your management network ports. And right, these devices, you know, they'll have a switch bank of, you know, a bunch of 10 gig or whatever interfaces that are for passing traffic. And then there's a secondary interface that's designed to be plugged into your management network. It's a completely separate NIC. Um, the problem is, is with the F5s, they have a um, they have what they call a self IP address. And I was a network engineer for a long time, so hopefully this is not going to be too nerdy for folks. But it's essentially used for device failover, where you've got a pair of devices. They have their own IP address. They're able to talk to each other on those for syncing configs and syncing state information. Um, and then there's usually an address that they use that's sort of a, it's a shared address. So it floats between whichever one is passing traffic. And the idea is, is that if it fails over all of the devices that are using it as their gateway, they just get a new layer two address. And then they, you know, ideally when it works, it actually, you can have a download going and it'll fail over and the download will keep working because it just doesn't, TCP IP handles the, the mm. little blip. Um, the problem is, is that those self IP addresses also by default had the management interface uh, enabled on them. So mm -hmm. what happened with the Redmond company was that they had a bunch of these things that were deployed correctly. They just didn't realize that that management interface was on this IP address. Granted, that IP probably shouldn't have been allowed in from the Internet to it. But, you know, people make mistakes. And so um, the sort of the, the end of it was that these devices were getting compromised in a way that they didn't think was possible because there was exposure that people didn't realize was there. So now you take that access you have to this device and you've got this privileged management backplane network, right? And having worked yeah. in that team at that Redmond company, it took about five minutes for us to get from our desktops through multiple hot boxes, smart cards, RSA tokens, different domain accounts, and to actually log into these things as a, an administrator was very complicated. But if you hack into this thing over the internet, it's got a management interface on the management network. So now you've got in, you've got access to the device, you've got a shell, and now you've got complete full access to the entire backplane of the management yeah. side, which is where, you know, people are like, keep it all safe, keep your management network safe. And that's true, but it is sort of highlights that these things are multi-home, generally speaking. So that is usually something that talks to the traffic side. There's something that talks to the backplane side. And there's very there's really no separation of those two traffic domains, if you will, when you're on the device itself. Yeah, yeah. Zero trust is hard. It's hard yeah. to get to actually work <laughs> the way you want. Yeah. Um, so you talked about like the the reasons why ransomware groups are going after these devices, but what makes it challenging for defenders? Oh, uh, almost everything. Um, so the there's a I'll just go through your list here. So one of the one of the big challenges is in in, in network infrastructure, um, your patching process can be is more complicated than say like Windows update. I mean it was just Patch Tuesday yesterday, right? And lots of people just say okay, let the, all the Windows desktops reboot. They may wait to patch their servers until a week or two just to make sure that there's no weird Microsoft bugs in the patch. Um, but the, everybody's gotten used to this patching cadence. So every month you patch all your Windows servers, you patch all your endpoint desktops, and then everything's fine. With networking stuff, um, you know, if we're talking about a VPN device that's got 10,000 users connected through it at any given time, um, taking that thing down is going to incur either downtime or loss of connectivity or productivity. Uh, even in the, some of the situations where, you know, if you can fail it over, 
it's still the type of thing that it has to be there. Those are generally maintenance window operations. So you do it late at night or in the, whatever your down period of traffic is. Um, and there's also having, having lived in that world for a long time, there's generally more stringent um, sort of requirements on the patching. So when the Redmond company I worked for, we had a bunch of F5s and a bunch of net scalers, and we would spend anywhere from six to nine months certifying the next build of code for these networking devices because the concern was if we start rolling this thing out across hundreds of systems in our network and you know three or four months in, all of a sudden we realized there's some bug. And now we've got you know large properties running like you know Outlook or Passport or Live that are going to start having problems. So yeah. you don't people in large organizations don't generally just get the patch and install it that same day. Um, mm -hmm. So there's the, the challenges with getting them upgraded when there's patches available. But the other problem too is that coming back to the whole lack of EDR, um, these devices aren't really designed to give you security warnings. Right, most of the logging, like I said, they're they're Linux, they're BSD. Anybody who's used those those operating system understands. There's syslog, you know, it's logging stuff that's generally device functionality, right? It's like, hey, you know, I might have a uh, uh, a server went down behind this load balancer. It's been marked out of service, or this thing failed a health check, or hey, I'm, you know, this process is has died and restarted. So it's it's mostly like the logging is designed more for something's wrong with the device, let's go troubleshoot it, or something's wrong with the, with the sort of infrastructure that it's the supporting, right? So like, hey, oh, my website's down. Okay, you go onto this load balancer, you look and say, okay, why is it down? Figure out what the status of the virtual server is. Why is it offline? And then so the, all of the logging is really designed to troubleshoot how it works. Hmm. It's not really designed to say, hey, there's someone who's sitting in here and SSH trying to SSH brute force this device. Right. right. Or, hey, there's a weird, you know, some some weird process just started up on this thing. Or, hey, a, yeah. a PHP file just showed up in the path of your web management interface. Right. Like somebody dropped a web shell. There's nothing that's going to tell you, hey, files shouldn't just be showing up here and like, you know, var www.html, but something just did. It's not just they're not they haven't been built with that in mind. Um, these mm -hmm. are just sort of this technology has evolved over years where it was primarily just just route traffic, pass packets, um, serve stuff. So there's there's that. So a lot of times organizations have no idea they've been breached by these devices or through these devices. Um, even with Mandiant, uh, their report last year, they, uh, as best I can tell and as best as they would tell me, um, there was a different investigation going on. They, the company had been breached and they just, as they traced it back, like where did this come from? Then the trail kind of goes cold at the network device. And they're like, oh, okay, so the attacks are coming from inside the house, essentially. Somebody's on this piece of networking gear. How long have they been here? We have no idea. Um, and so then there's then there's 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 the complications too uh, in that the networking network engineering. Um, I will never throw shade on my fellow network engineers. I spent almost two decades doing that, um, but they're not always the most security uh, versed, right? So they may they may you know they may be very good at setting up. BGP and you know MPLS and all of these other routing technologies, but security may not be something that they're super familiar in. It may not be their job, or maybe there's another security team that's sort of supposed to say, "Hey, we're the security team. We run the security for the company." But do those guys understand network security? Because network security and sort of endpoint security yeah. um, are very different beasts. And then yeah. I think I kind of already touched on this: the vendors, the security development stuff that we see nowadays in operating systems doesn't really exist. Yeah, the the nineties called and they went their nineties called. They want their back. they want their bones back. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I'll I'll hand it over cool. to you, um, Nate. Mm -hmm. uh, you're gonna uh, yes. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it'll some, work well. <laughs> do some hacker stuff. One second here. Yeah. Let me share my hacker screen. All right, so. So what I've got here, uh, is this visible, Tyson? Yep. Okay, cool. So this is just Metasploit running on Kali, which is only for this demo. I don't recommend Kali myself. Um, so what we're going to do first is we're going to hack into the, um, we're going to hack into the Netscaler uh, Citrix device using the same 
Um, using the same uh, vulnerability from the summer. This is not Citrix bleed. Explain. Hold on a sec. I have to remember where this is. This is the one that uh, it was. It was uh, attributed to the Fin8 uh, group. Yeah. Doing ransomware. Yeah. Yep. So what I do is I set up my. So I have to set up. So I'm setting up my targeting for which device I'm going after. I think it's this uh encryption is Okay, so now all right, so now that actually worked first time. Cool. So now I've got a shell on a net scaler. So if I Looking here, you can see I'm in a Netscape. Here's my Netscaler config. LS and a config. You can see I've got all my Netscaler configuration files are in here. So I've got a shell on this Netscaler. Now, what I'll do is I'll background that one. And then I can go in and I can get to, uh, I'll have an F5. So that was literally as much time as it took. Right. Um, That's seconds. the... the... I mean, they were able to set up infrastructure to automate this and yep. compromise thirty thousand machines. Yep. yep. I mean, you can you can really do. I mean, it's it's trivial now. Um, you know, people if you if you talk to the folks over at Gray Noise, they pick up a lot of sort of indiscriminate scanning and, and throwing uh, exploit payloads. But it's pretty trivial to go and just say, okay, I'm going to look at Shodan. I'm going to find a bunch of vulnerable, find a bunch of net scalers, and just dump the list of IPs and then go and specifically target them. Um, hopefully to avoid your IP address getting picked up by gray noise and people saying, hey, we know that this bad this guy's doing bad stuff. Um, exploit Linux 5. Let's see that 5. Oh, uh, no, HTTP, HTTP 5. One control. Let's see. And so, let's see here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set my targeting to do I have anything set here? No. All right, so almost so now we go in and see now we've just hacked the F5. All right. So if I go are, are you are you pivoting from one the net scaler to the, nope, to the not uh, yet nope um like i didn't that was uh, now theoretically yes i could have i didn't it would have taken a little bit more time than i had to re relay out my network um but what i could be doing is that say you had a net scaler that was your vpn endpoint um and you use it to allow your net your network admins to get into your dmz to manage all your networking equipment i could have uh had i like i said reconfigured my topology Mm -hmm. hacked into the net scaler and then used it as a as a route to hack through it into the load balancer that might be in a dmz network or a management network that you think is completely isolated from the internet mm -hmm. uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do a pivot attack like that against a actual uh, windows server here in a second so just to show that i'm not lying um, you can see that i am on an F5. So there's a whole bunch of F5 config files, their big IP license files, all your load balancing configs. So we're going to background that session. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say use host multi. I'm going to use what's called the auto route plugin in um, Metasploit. So that's session two, we're going to say set submit. Or do that. So now we've added what I've done is, and I, I'm kind of skipping some steps, right? Had, had I hacked into this this uh, device itself, or when I hacked into it, I could I would have done some sort of scoping around and say, hey, okay, let me find, um, let me see what other networks this thing is on. Let me look and find out where all the servers are because that's the things I want to hack into. Um, just for, you know, just to do the Hollywood thing, we're making this fast and I'm not showing you discovering all of these networks in the background. Um, so then I can do this. So now that I know, let's use auxiliary, let's see if this works. Let's scan. 
Ports 139. So what I'm looking for is I'm going to scan um, the backend network for systems running SMB. So, aha, and there, as you'll see, I've, what I've found is, so I'm, keep in mind, I'm hacked into an F5 through, the man, through its management address. This IP back here is completely inaccessible to my colleague machine. So I'm, it's, port scanning through the F5, telling me there's a server behind it that's running TCP, it's running SMB. And I'm gonna say, okay, well, maybe these admins are lazy and I'm going to go and use the good old eternal blue exploit because it just works really well. Um, and then this is set L host. And then we go exploit. So now it's exploiting this Windows machine in the back. And this sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Sending stage. It should. Aha, there we go. So now you can see I'm in Windows System 32 on this back end Windows server. Mm -hmm. and who am I? Um, and if I do a get UID, you can see that I'm now Windows uh, system on this Windows server. So it's game over. I've com I now completely own the Windows machine. Um, you can see that I've still, you can see that I've still got sessions to everybody too, right? I've got my got one into the NetScaler. I've got one into my F5. I've got a system, a shell into this Windows machine. And I could just keep doing this as long as I, as far as I needed to, right? I could then, I could theoretically set up another auto route on this Windows machine and hack into things behind it. Like you can just keep going. Um, I could also do things like dropping other C2 things. Um, the the talk I did last year about hacking load balancers, I was using the Sliver open source uh, C2 framework and that I was able to compile binaries for BSD for for Linux. So I, you know, I was, I liked that and I was able to sort of tamper with their configs and get it to start up when the machine boots, get it to keep running if it fails over, get it to hide the the, the loader scripts inside the config backups, um, kind of like what we saw actors start to do this year. Um, so yeah, it's that's as easy as it is. And there is really nothing that you know. There's no there's no logs about any of this stuff going on, um, if you don't believe me. I can even show you. So there can oops. So I'll, I'll SSH in legitimately to this F5. Um, so there's really nothing here. So if I cat secure log, the only thing that there really is in this whole log is me. There's me logging in before the call via the web administration panel. And here's me logging in legitimately. Um, just now, well, yeah, here's me logging in just now. So there's nothing in the secure log. Um, you know, last log. Oops. I don't know what the heck happened there. Um, mm -hmm. There is maybe, I think that this exploit does leave a little bit of, uh, a little bit of signatures in one of these logs. Uh, okay, rest. Let's see. But I mean, even even yeah. even if stuff's there, you know, you would have to know like how to go in and 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 interpret, you know, these logs. Yeah. You know, yeah. I might be a, an expert in F five logging, you oh, know, yeah. what it means. So that it's actually a really good uh, place to uh, segue. Um, I wanted to share. Um, share a little I, bit I will as you're as you're loading this up I will may I will point out to you you make a very good point I am an expert in f5 equipment I worked there for a decade I know more about that way those things work than most people out there and I wouldn't even be able to tell you definitively if this thing got exploited like I'm able to I know what the exploit looks like or I know what the signature looks like once I've seen the exploit once I've run it once I've fiddled around with it and say okay I run this thing 
and something weird shows up in this. It's exploiting the the REST Java daemon on the F5's management interface. So I was able to say, okay, when I see this log message after I run the exploit, that's something bad. Now, if we're talking about an O-day, I mean, you don't know what you don't know. And that becomes the problem is that the device is just going to say, oh, this process did something weird, but it's not really enough to tell you that anything, there's, there's no real signature for it. And the vendors, you know, the load balancing, the networking device vendors aren't developing signatures. They're not really saying that it's all after the fact, right? It's IR of like, okay, we saw something happen. This is what it looks like when it happens. Um, but there's very little ways to be sort of proactive or even sort of heuristic based um, of saying, hey, we don't know if this is an exploit, but the behavior of this activity matches what we know malicious behavior has looked like in the past. Maybe mm -hmm. you should go take a look and see if that's what's going on here. Yeah. So there's zero, almost zero like threat detection or integrity monitoring for these devices. Um, can you see my? Uh, yes. Okay. So what I'm showing here is the the Eclipsium supply chain security platform, and um, I'm looking at in this case we're looking at a a client PC. It's a Dell Dell device, and what Eclipsium does is we look into all of the hardware, firmware, and software components of of your devices and and tell you, um, you know what's what's going on, um. You know, are there any uh, threats at this very low level? These are things that um, you know your ED, typical EDRs is not going to uh, not going to cover. Um, you know, they they don't. Uh, what makes Eclipsium special is we know what good ought to look like, and that's very hard to do unless you're analyzing these binaries. Um, I, we all we do in addition to client PCs, we do servers, and we also cover these network devices. So here I'm I'm looking at um, you know different types of network devices that we have in our demo environment. If you click in on one, then uh, you know we're going to be monitoring the the integrity of the, uh, the device firmware. But then um, there's other detections that that we're uh, developing as well. Maybe Nate, do you want to talk about um, some of the types of things that we we can look at on the device? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think that you've got. A, so this is a Cisco box. Um, so what we've done is we've got, we do a few different ways of detecting things, uh, and it's evolved. It's been evolving and improving as, over the last year. Um, so initially, we can do we can do essentially like sort of like your generic bone scan. Hey, it's running this version of iOS in this case, it has these vulnerabilities because we know this. Um, then we can also do a, an authenticated scan where the, you know, the sensor essentially logs in and it looks for things that are uh, amiss. So I think in that one that you were showing, it had a malicious firewall configuration where, you know, mm -hmm. a firewall rule had been added that put to, that uh, forwarded traffic from one network to another. And so that's, that can be something suspicious. Um, it also was detecting Maris botnet, which I can't remember how that's done. Um, as we get to the more, some of the more advanced stuff that we released this year for, I think we support initially uh, Citrix, Juniper, Cisco, and F5, um, we actually can log in. It, it all has to be authenticated, um, at least for now. Um, the, the running a sensor on a network device is uh, questionable with how many people want to do that. But uh, what it does is it'll log in and we collect all of the sort of uh, vendors golden images of their firmware and we uh, essentially unpack them. We know what all of the binaries should look like from a hashing perspective. And so then when you've got, you know, you say, okay, I've got this, well, let's say an F5, like you pulled up, you tell the sensor to go scan it, it figures out what version it is, and then it runs some magic on the device to collect all of the hashes of the important system binaries and also look at like, the web administration uh, GUI path folders and say, okay, here's all the files that are in there, um, everything that it can, it can, once it collects all that information, it can then uh, compare it offline or to say offline from the device to what we know good looks like. And then say, hey, yes, everything's good, everything's fine. Or maybe it's, you know, if it says, hey, you've got a weird, your version of SSHD doesn't match what the hash should be. You should probably go figure out why you're running a different copy of the SSH daemon um, or, hey, we did a scan and we just found a weird PHP file that showed up. You should probably go take a look and see what is this PHP file. Um, the idea, once again, being we don't necessarily know what a zero-day attack is going to look like, 
but we do know the techniques that attackers will use at post exploitation. So we're we're trying to essentially look at what that behavior is and say let's flag it and give give administrators administrators or organizations um, some extra time to go and take a look. Right? Maybe they catch this over the weekend versus catching it two months later when their organization's ransomware. Right? If they have at least some level of an early alert, they can go and take a look. Um, you know, obviously, if there are customers, they can say, hey, can we send this to you and tell us what it is? And, you know, we, we can reverse the binaries if it's, say, like a weird SSHD or, you know, it's fairly easy just to take a, a PHP file and look at it and say, yeah, this is a web shell. Hmm. Great. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I know we're uh, coming up towards the end um, of the allotted time, um, but, I would, you know, this is the important part, right? Is like, OK, this is a really bad problem. You know, it, uh, these ransomware groups are attacking this entire class of devices that's not very well protected. Um, Eclipsium can help with the first two points here. We can provide supply chain intelligence. So I know organizations don't frequently change their network gear, but when they do, you know, they can they can see, OK, you know, I'm I'm thinking considering a checkpoint or Palo Alto or something for my firewall, which which one is more secure? We can we can provide that supply chain intelligence and then we can add, help you to add a layered defense, you know, in addition to your vulnerability management and patching, which we can help with as well. But we we can actually detect threats. We can detect detect uh, integrity changes on these devices so that you're not relying solely on these uh, preventative measures, but you can also, um, you know, reactively detect uh, active compromise. And then um, maybe, uh, uh, you know, to, to the CISA's point, you know, that, that binding operational directive that they put out in June, you know, we should be paying more attention to our internet facing uh, uh, infrastructure devices. You know, um, it's not only uh, network devices, but also maybe uh, server management uh, things for, you know, remote management, baseboard management controllers, things like that. And then, um, Nate, do you want to? Yeah. About yeah, the vendors. yeah, there's the, the networking device vendors. Um, they are still figuring out how to do proper vulnerability response. Um, you know, I, I worked at Microsoft and MSRC for quite a while. And while, you know, people may have say what they will about Microsoft, they do have a very mature vulnerability um, response process of, you know, people sending in vulnerabilities, they, you know, doing the whole patch process. Um, and then, you know, simul simultaneously patching everything. The, the network vendors um, are a little less, uh, um, skilled at this we'll say so i know in 2020 we found what we noticed is that f5 when they patched their that vuln in the summer they announced the vulnerability was fixed at the end of june but then as we started tracking looking at the versions that they'd fixed they'd been slowly releasing patched versions for about a month and then they finally said hey you know when the last version had been patched was when they put their advisor out saying hey this vulnerability is out here's all the versions that it's fixed in but for about a month you know, there was a version that's sitting out there with a software patch that they hadn't said there was a vulnerability patch in this version that you could get that they hadn't told anybody about yet. So like mm -hmm. that is something that at Microsoft we would have never done because there's always the fear that if someone says, if there's somebody out there who's patch diffing and says, hey, they just released a new version, let me go and diff it and see what's changed between the last version. You know, if someone's actually doing that for these devices, that's an easy way to say, oh, well, they just changed the thing. Now I know that there's a vulnerability here and, you know, the people that are good at exploit development and reverse engineering, that's really all they need is to say, hey, something changed. And from there, they can just sort of walk it back and figure out the exploit. So there's mm -hmm. that aspect of it. Uh, there's also the other aspect, and this was somewhat frustrating, and I know it's frustrating with Citrix Bleed, uh, which unfortunately I can't demo it because I can't get a demo license that of, <laughs> enables that functionality. But the long and short of it was that when the exploit was successful, you could attack the VPN endpoint of the Netscaler and you could pull session information of people who had active sessions through this VPN device. Um, because of usability concerns, um, when you reboot a Netscaler, that session information is apparently preserved. So that way, if you're like, hey, we had to reboot it, 
Um, you, that way all your users don't have to re-authenticate and do their multi-factor a second time. So it's sort of like a make things easier on the end user. The problem was that with the Citrix bleed, if your device had been exploited and then you went and patched it, all of those session tokens that were on the Netscaler were still there and they were still valid. So if an attacker had breached you beforehand and had your session tokens, you yeah. could patch it, reboot it, everything's fine, except that they could still get in. Uh, and then right. weeks later, Citrix actually updated their, or I think they they may have said something about it in passing, but they didn't make a big enough deal about it. Finally, they said, yeah, you really need to go and forcefully kill and nullify all of the active sessions after you do the patch. Um, so to me, it was weird. Like, had I been working that on vulnerable response, I would have said, hey, part of the patching process should be just tell them, look, this patch is going to reset all your sessions, install it, and then as sort of like a post-install script, just have it run the command that resets all of them and then reboot, right? That could mm -hmm. have saved people a lot of headaches because there's people that, you know, they have a thousand things going on. They're like, hey, we patched it, we rebooted it, we got through the maintenance window, everything's good, we're done. And they weren't done. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, the, the way that it's handled, the way that it's addressed seems, needs to improve. And I don't know that these vendors are really that well-versed in how to do security response, right? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, of every vendor that comes out with a thing, you know, Fortinet has their challenges, Netscaler has theirs, everybody's got their own different set of challenges. Um, but at the end of the day, it's some of the most important gear on the internet. And if they can't, if we can't keep it safe, we're just, you know, we're going to keep losing. That is, uh, I, I, I won't go over this, but if people want to uh, look it up, the binding operational directive from CISA about exposed management interfaces, it actually provides a lot of good background on why attackers are pivoting to, um, you know, from traditional client endpoints to these these types of, uh, you know, server management interfaces and network uh, network devices. It's worth uh, worth a read. Um, yeah, Melissa, I will I will hand it back over to you um, if there's any any questions from the audience. Yeah, so a couple of them kind of segueing from the network devices. There was a question about specifically what types of network device vendors do we support here at Eclipsium? Oh, let's see here. Uh, I know we support, uh, so as far as the, the, the firmware integrity portion, F5 Citrix, Netscaler, or sorry, F5 Citrix, uh, Juniper, and Cisco are supported in that aspect. From vulnerability detection, we also support uh, Fortinet, Oh God, Barracuda. Um, there's a few, most of the enterprise level stuff we support. Um, I don't know that we have checkpoint support yet. And I'm not entirely sure on Palo Alto. Um, some of the, 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 the challenges become like how much functionality do they get? Does the device offer, right? So for doing the actual binary firmware integrity verification, we need to be able to log in and actually look at the binaries. And there's devices like Fortinet which up until recently, they won't even let you find out the hash of the binary. And even with their most recent version, they won't let you copy files on or off of it other than config. So, you know, should you see the hash change on a Fortinet device, too bad, call Fortinet. There's nothing we can do because they don't give us a method to pull this suspicious file off and look at it. Um, but we don't, and the ones that we don't really support right now is most of the Soho stuff. So if you're talking like Netgears or D-Link or... I think we actually do support Microtech because they're not quite as Soho as people think. Hmm. But I, I, I'll, I'll speak on behalf of uh, product management. Is that they, if if uh, if anybody listening here, um, you know, has a particular uh, class of devices that they they do want Eclipsium to help monitor, and we don't right now, we we will prioritize that. Um, uh, but yeah, we 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 see it as a as a growing threat, um, not because we want to, but because you know we we're seeing the attack activity, um, you know, grow in this regard. So it, it's going to be a uh, an, an area of continued focus for Eclipsium in uh, the next the coming year. Great. Um, next one was, um, and I think we did touch on this, but just to make sure it gets answered, answered and clarified, is how do these scans really differ from what they're already getting from a vulnerability scanner? So the difference there is that a vulnerability scanner is just going to go and look at the version, right? Um, you know, if you're, we're talking about something like Qualys or Tenable, generally speaking, those are just going to go and say, hey, it's running this version. We know that these CVEs apply to this version. 
And that's as much as it's going to tell you. It's not actually going to tell, it's not going to look at the integrity of the firmware. It's not going to look for files that have shown up that shouldn't be there. Um, and as far as I know, they don't really look for weird malicious configuration um, stuff that's going on. And I guess one of the things I forgot to mention is that we also, when there are uh, available IOCs, like what does a log message look like when it's exploited, uh, we will, we can also do um, those IOCs. We can pull the logs off the device and say, hey, you, you know, the YAR rule popped and said it's been exploited for whatever vulnerability. So the vulnerability scanners aren't really going to do that. They're more just for um, patching sort of compliance uh, and information that way. Uh, the last question is the one that I get to answer. Um, there was a couple people who pinged in asking about the slides and the recording, and the answer is yes. We are going to complete the recording, and we will be sharing it out. Um, so everyone who was on here will be getting an email from me uh, tomorrow with the links to the recording and the slides, and they also will be available on Eclipsium.com. I believe at this point I'm not seeing any other additional questions, so I wanted to thank both Nate and Tyson for another great presentation and thank everyone for taking time out of their day and joining us here. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season, and we hope to see you on the next webinar in January. Thank you, Tyson, and thank you, Nate. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone. Happy holidays.